I've been super excited to have this conversation with you because, I mean, we have a lot of people in common. And one of the things that I hear consistently about you is you think out of the box. And, you know, I think that that's something that's missing in when it comes to fertility and the way that women approach fertility is, you know, we get all these crazy ideas that, you know, Hey, you hit a certain point and it's never going to happen for you, but you and your work are proving otherwise. So, so why don't we start off by, you know, sharing with women listening a little bit about what you do and we'll start there and we'll just run wherever this conversation <laughs> takes us. Thank you. Sorry, these are my new things. I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm learning to become high tech. So I got iPad and this. So I'm not, sorry if I'm not. You sound great. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so first of all, my name is Dr. Zahir Merhi. Um, you know, I'm the founder of Rejuvenating Fertility Center. Uh, actually, this is our logo. I was, I'm wearing my shirt today. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> I love it. I and love our it. logo is reproduce, rejuvenate, and relax. Because to me, you know, these are the three R's that women need to have because the, the brain, which is relaxation, is really related to your reproductive system and also how you rejuvenate your body, fighting aging, all is related, right? But in summary, you know, we started Rejuvenating Fertility Center two years ago. And uh, you know, we, we started uh, in Manhattan, and now we have Connecticut office as well. Uh, we have two IVF labs and we have three other locations. So total of five locations, one in Long Island, one in uh, Westchester and New Rochelle and one in Brooklyn. Now, um, I, I consider ourselves the first non-conventional IVF place, right? The reason why is I, I genuinely think that it's time to change the fertility for um, or at least IVF, if we're talking about IVF per se, because IVF started 46 years ago. And, you know, if you look at, the, if you look, even though it started natural IVF without medication, since then, the conventional IVF protocols have been the same, pumping with shots, pumping with shots. But So they haven't really changed, right? Um, if you close your eyes and go to any, to all, to a lot of centers, I don't think you would know the difference in the protocols. So, it, it, you know, and if you look nationwide, the pregnancy rate in the United States is 50%. Why? 50% of patients don't get pregnant with IVF regardless of your age. Why? Because conventional IVF doesn't work for that, in my opinion. Now, we, we, we you know, we stepped back, you know, and I started this eight years ago, or at least, at least nine years ago, um, when I used to work at um, a new home fertility center, I worked there for six years before I started my own thing. Uh, you know, we started uh, doing a lot of things outside the box, focusing on individualized treatments. Patients talk to me and ask me, oh, what is the protocol that I'm gonna get on the consultation? I'm like, I don't know, we just met. Like, I wanna see your body. I wanna see your results. I wanna see, you know, so, because I don't give to people the same protocol. Right, even the same patient with two different cycles, I don't give them the same the same protocol because the body every month is very different. You saw so we so so that's what we, you know, the the, the uh, sorry sorry for, sorry if I'm you know, comparing myself to Whole Foods, but we're really like the Whole Foods of IVF, right? The, 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 I love it. because we use we we do believe going back and and using. Uh, less is better. Uh, you know, if we, we have 10 types of IVF. You don't, you come to us, we have not just conventional, we have conventional, natural, all that stuff. So there is a lot we could offer based on what you want, right? You go to whole food, there is everything from low calorie to no sugar to high sugar, right? So you could choose what you want, right? right. And also you can make it your own. Look, I always, uh, you know, People love Chipotle, right? Because you make your own thing, right? You have control over it. And let me tell you, a lot of people, a lot of patients, you will be surprised. They actually know more about their fertility treatment and what drugs does to them, um, you know, compared to 
uh, the doctors, like they know if clomid doesn't work, it doesn't work. If letrozole doesn't work, doesn't work. Follicin doesn't work. I know I've done this, it doesn't work. But a lot of time, because we're doctors, and I'm not saying anything about any doctor, because I respect all my colleagues, and they're all my friends, and, and you know, I, I love all of them. But sometimes as physicians, we, we tend to ignore what the patients say, because we think we know it all. But no, patients do know their body. And I do believe in this. I have patients who tells me before they walk in, before an ultrasound, Dr. Murray, I think I have a cyst. And you know what? I do an ultrasound, there's a cyst. They know their body and their ovaries. They know. So I'm not saying everyone does, but a lot of people do know. So, so um, I really think, you know, um, the Rejuvenating Fertility Center uh, is, is, is here to provide a lot of other things other than jumping to IVF as well. We do PRP ovarian rejuvenation. We do ozone sauna. We, it's not just for fertility. If you want to delay reproductive system, if you're in menopause and you want to have uh, 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 try to regulate your menstrual cycle, you want to increase your libido, we're here for you. It's not just for just, you know, again, the rejuvenation part is very important. Yeah. And I love what you're saying, because I think your point is well taken. So I remember when I was struggling with my fertility, I knew everything, like, even though I went to law school, I probably could have gotten a certificate in reproductive endocrinology because I was so focused on me. And I think that's a, a, a piece that I agree with you that sometimes people forget for better or worse. Um, that right. people forget that we wear this meat suit all day. So we know it quite well. So when, when a woman comes to you and, and, you know, after she has maybe been trying naturally for a little while and it's just not working out, you know, what are some of the things that you take into consideration? Because so many of the women listening to this think it's just age. Like, oh my God, I'm over 35. It's over for me. Share a little bit about that. Well, look, the reality is, uh, you know, the clock is sticking not all on everyone, right? Whether you're five years old, I still remember, I can't believe I'm 12 when I was five. When I was 12, I'm, I, I can't believe I was five yesterday. So it's like time is running, right? Especially with the pandemic, everything seems faster. So th that's one. So being, I think, uh, cautious about the time is extremely important. And by the way, Rosanna, I always tell patients, and I did one of the interview a couple of years ago, Washington Post, talking about that we should start education about fertility for at, at high school when we teach or, or middle school when we teach them about sex, safe sex, and condoms. We don't tell them about reproductive aging and menopause. I generally think we should also tell them, you know. Uh, about that. It's not just only about safe sex, right? W Mom has to tell their daughters about what menopause is and what the symptoms are. And if she went through early menopause, she should be careful. You know, I think there is a lot of education right there in order for us to fight the clock and fight aging and be preventative of other things, right? We use condom to prevent STDs, right? So we freeze eggs to prevent aging or, or freeze. Eggs. So there's a lot of things we could do as a preventative in the fertility world, number one. Number two, I mean, I hate when doctors say, oh, it's your age. Patients know their age, okay? <laughs> they know. If they're 40, they know they're 40. <laughs> if they're 50, they know they're 50. Okay, if someone is a little bit, uh, ha don't tell them go lose weight. They, they, everyone, I, I was, today I was exercising. I couldn't lose a quarter of a quarter. I've been trying to lose half a pound. Look, I, I can't even, so, <laughs> you know, we can't judge anybody for what they are. We need to work with what we have. Look, we are an outcome of technology, environment, toxins, chemicals, all those are making us get more obese, get more infertile, get more, more. that's the reality. That's the reality, okay? So, so I'm, we're here to kind of find solutions in order to help couple, regardless of their age and weight, have babies, number one. Number two, I hate when they say, oh, I have, I have a patient, for example, right? She said the cutoff for IVF is 42. She, saw, she went to that clinic 
two months before her birthday. When, you know, the preparation takes a few months. When she turned 42 plus one day, they said, oh, you don't qualify for IVF. I'm not joking. They kicked her out. So it just amazes me that, you know, they put cutoff, which I don't, it's okay. This is their policy. Sometimes they have people on top of them telling them what to do. But we're treating people. We're not treating just numbers, in my opinion, right? You, uh, someone could be 42 and their ovaries is like a 25. And I have people in their 25 and their 20s who are menopausal or with premature ovaries. So that's one. Two, if we have all these cutoffs, if everybody has 42 year age, 42 cutoff as age, how are we going to move science forward? How, if we don't reach 43s and 44 and 45 and even 50, how am I going to move science forward? People tell me, oh, what's your success rate? I'm like, I don't know, but be careful what you compare. Apples to oranges. If I want to choose people in their 20s who have high ovarian reserve, I'm, my pregnancy rate will be 100. If I take people who every comer and I, be, I like difficult cases, which I do, my pregnancies will be lower, not because I'm a bad doctor, it's just because the population that people tend to choose can. Having said that, I genuinely believe at RFC, we want to move the science forward and make, it, and we've done it, right? When yeah. we started PRP over, when, we st when I started PRP over and rejuvenation on the East Coast four, five years ago, people thought I was crazy, right? Now, if you Google PRP over and rejuvenation, even in New York City, there's maybe 10 places that does it. Right. So it is okay. It is okay. I'm glad other people are also doing it, which means they are convinced it works and now they're helping other people as well. So that's what we're doing. All right. That's our goal here. Yeah. And I love that because I think that's the point is why would we be using a cutoff that may have made sense 25 years ago? And if we ever intend to move forward and give women options and give women a chance, I mean, because how dare you want a career and a family, right? Right, like, right. And, and to educate, I think your point is well taken as well to educate earlier about fertility preservation so people understand the impact. It doesn't mean that you can't pursue a career and have a family, but you can be more educated about the ways that you can be proactive about your fertility. So, and that's really interesting. I mean, about moving the science forward. So let's talk about PRP because like I have so many women that come through my programs and they hear about <laughs> PRP. So why don't you just share a little bit about like, what is this? Right. So PRP is platelet-rich plasma. It's your own platelet and plasma. We just take it out of your blood by regular blood truth and multiple certifications with kits and all that. And then we concentrate this platelet and plasma and then put them directly in your ovaries. You can put them in the uterus. PRP can be done put anywhere. We didn't discover PRP. PRP has been in business for 25 years or more. It's used for hair loss. So you put it in the scalp, it grows hair. Google that. It's used for um, uh, uh, knees and injuries. A lot of athletes, when they hurt, not just athletes, but you know, we hear athletes did the PRP in their knees to help and fasten the, the healing process of, of their joints. Uh, it's used for facial rejuvenation. It's used for then dent and dentistry. It's used in a lot of things. Now, I didn't. I wasn't the. I'm not that smart to think about putting it in the ovaries. Full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> but the Greek, the Greek people, uh, which I have great respect for, are the people who started the the PRP in the ovaries. And they said, listen, if it if you're putting PRP in the scalp and it's growing hair follicles, you might as well put it in the ovaries and grows ovarian follicles. And they were right. So that's the, that's the concept of PRP. It's not, it, it's it's something that helps women temporarily for a few months, uh, you know, restore some of the ovarian function and improve quantity slash quality of their eggs in order to take advantage uh, and make and make babies. Um, you know, so that's that's in summary the PRP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, I've been I've been looking at a lot of the things that are happening in that area, and it's really exciting. It's it's really inspiring to see how you can begin to rejuvenate and breathe life back into these 
into your ovaries and all the, and, and the follicles. So when you're, when you're thinking about, uh, a, a woman who comes to you and says, Hey, I really want to give myself the best possible chances here. You know, when I was looking at your website and when we had spoken before, I was really impressed with how many modalities you are looking at, like the ozone therapy, like all of these, these things, including PRP. So it would be awesome if you would just share a little bit about like, what are some of the things you consider when a woman comes to you and says, Hey, I want to give this a go. I'm in my forties and it's on my heart to have a baby. Like, what are some of the things you consider? So at RFC, you know, we, we, we think a little bit, not just you're an egg or a uterus, you're a body, right? It's all connected with each other. It starts from your brain, the stress, the because trust me half of the game is stress as well right it becomes <laughs> oh yeah i know i know we'll talk right. about that more but yeah we think we think about you know the supplement the diet the inflammation in the body the previous history that's why when i do my consultations and i drive my patients crazy i i i talk and i ask more questions than i look at the results right because everybody has a different story and everybody, you, I'm like an investigator. You have to understand where the piece of the puzzle is missing. And this is how you find sometimes the trick. Now, um, as far as all the modalities that we give, as I said, we believe inflammation, for example. Now, we believe there are studies on it. Inflammation is bad for air quality. Endometriosis is inflammation. It's bad for air quality. It lowers implantation. Also, we're coming with anti-inflammatory agent. There's a lot of things you can give for someone, pills or chemicals who wants to have a baby, right? So we're trying to see what is the holistic ways that lowers body inflammation because aging is also inflammation. That's why we get arthritis as we get older. We get glaucoma and all that. So ozone is the most holistic anti-inflammatory things. Ozone, ozone is layer, it covers the earth. But ozone, when you give it to the body, it also it lowers body inflammation. And this has been used for decades. Since World War I, they used to sterilize things with ozone, uh, which is a powerful mm -hmm. oxygen. Mm -hmm. And it's used for uh, eczema and dermatitis. It's used directly for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. It's used in the IV for HIV, AIDS, and other inflammatory processes. It's injected in the joints for men. And also now we're putting it vaginally for women to blow ozone in the vaginal area, uterus, and, and the ovaries, and also through the skin. So it's a machine that patients sit naked, her, the head is out so you won't breathe it. It goes through the skin, and also the patient places a disposable tiny hose vaginally that blows ozone. So it's half an hour, twice a week for three weeks. People ask me, well, when do I start ozone? The more you do, of course, the better. Not because I want your money. It's just because we built inflammation over the years. It didn't come overnight. If I smoked a cigarette uh, 10 years ago, it, it built some type of inflammation in my body, right? So we need to reverse all, all the chemicals and, and inflammatory processes in our body. So inflammation plays an important role. And we've actually published uh, two papers, one on endometriosis, one on poor air quality and ozone, and we've shown that it improves both. One, two, um, acupuncture, right? Like we do believe back to the stress, right? One, the environment in our office is an environment that release, you know, really, you know, it starts from the front desk. It's all stress-free, the music. The, you have to come to a place where you feel not stressed out, right? You've already lived, lived there's a lot of stress mm -hmm. in life, Roseanne. There is... Right. Uh, a <laughs> pandemic and inflation and stock market is crashing and uh, it, it, the whole environment is not great. So we need positivity, right? And you need to come to a place where it's positive from the front desk, who is the face of the clinic, in my opinion, till the doctor. And that's very important. If you add acupuncture to this, right? And we do offer acupuncture. So everything is related to that. Right. There is a lot of, lot, look, there are, we've published papers showing that mice who ate cooked 
bad quality diet compared to normal diet, they had bad egg quality, even though they didn't gain weight. So I can be skinny and eat crappy food, this is my language, and I don't have bad eggs. Right. And I can be a little bit heavy and I eat healthy food and I can be, have better eggs. So what I'm trying to say is the environment plays an important role, right? Hand sanitizers is bad for egg quality and sperm quality. It has chemicals. If you look at inactive ingredients. The triclosan and, and yeah. Yeah. If you have a box, show it. If, I don't know if you have one. I don't have one next to me. Yeah, no, I, it, I, I don't use hand sanitizers for that reason. Like, yeah, I'm like, yeah. Look at the, the, so the active ingredient is all alcohol. The inactive ingredient is a lot of chemicals. You will be shocked that no one tells you about that right. it's bad for egg quality. It's, look, it's better for my business when people have, but I hate it. Okay. Full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it because look, I mean, it used to be 5% of women have infertility, now up to 20%. It's, it's, it's increasing significantly. Even in men, inf male infertility is increasing. The, the hand sanitizer, which is first uh, fertility friendly sanitizer for both men and women. We did start the process a year ago, but we're, we were fine tuning things and everything. So, so we're very excited to do that. So what I'm trying to tell you is the lifestyle we're, we're at RFC, we target from lifestyle to stress, to inflammation, to everything, to diet and supplements, because all those play an important role in reproduction. Yeah, and it's incredible. And, and I love that you're pointing that out because they're, they're, people tend to think about fertility is, hey, I'm just going to go to a doctor. They're going to give me a pill. They're going to give me a shot and I don't have to think about this. But what fertility really is, is a constellation of things. It's a puzzle with many different pieces. And, and I love the work that you and Amy do. And I, and I think it's interesting that people forget the mind piece. And that's mm -hmm. where I play. Mm -hmm. And right. because I notice, I mean, because I work with so many professional women who are, you know, physicians, lawyers, teachers, nurses, engineers, you know, and people have this idea that the mind plays zero role. Like, hey, I'm just going to go get fixed and somebody's going to fix me. And it's like, I learned from personal experience that you can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on treatment, but if your mind is not in the game, it's a huge piece that's missing. So what are your thoughts on that? Okay. First of all, people who tell you stress is not a player. It, 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 I'm sorry. I'm going to say to them they're wrong. Okay. Yeah. For many reasons. Number one, in order for us to know if there's a if stress impact in fertility, you need to do a randomized trial. I'm a very I'm a scientific guy. Okay, I'm an evidence-based guy. I'm a professor at the university and I train people. Now, in a randomized trial, you need two groups: a group that have stress and a group that doesn't have stress, who are undergoing infertility. If you find me someone who's undergoing infertility without stress, let me know. <laughs> so by definition, we can design such a study. Point, right? There's no control. It's impossible to design. But we see it. We mm -hmm. see that. The, well, look, when you, first of all, FSH, everyone knows FSH, FSH, FSH. Comes from the brain. Go and keep running, 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 running. Anorexic women have very low FSH because they have stress on their body and they don't ovulate on their own. So, it, you know, the, the, what I'm, if, you, if you're stressed out and going through bad, bad moments, you will, your period becomes irregular from the stress. Now, I see it all the time. And I, I, mean, I remember this patient that I never forget. She was a lawyer. She's a lawyer and her husband is a lawyer. They were divorcing, bad divorce. She came to me, hysterical crying, bad divorce. There's no good divorce. But, you know, so, so, and we, we want, she wants to do egg freezing because she does, she wants the future. We're doing egg freezing. We're getting two, three eggs per cycle, right? Divorce finished. She went on vacation, came back. We got 15 eggs. Her number of follicles is booming. I'm not, I swear to God. So if you tell me, she was stress-free. If you tell me stress doesn't play a role, 
how can someone making two eggs now is making 15 eggs? Just up with, and by the way, this was six months later on, which as someone gets older, you think you get less, but she finished her divorce. She was relieved. She was on vacation. So, and I have a lot of patients who take a break and I do tell them, go vacation. You go to a sunny place and come back. Your ovaries are happy. So it does play a role. FSH comes from the brain. Stress out people, the FSH either goes up or goes too down because the brain and the stress is what affect FSH release. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, we can never do a randomized trial just because the fact that, you know, everyone has stress who are undergoing infertility. Right. And, and, and I think, though, in this scenario, anecdotal evidence is just as persuasive because people are living it. You don't need a trial to tell you that this is true. <laughs> You're look, living I, it. But, but look, I respect trials, but mm -hmm. also trials, it, it, we're human. You might not fit in a trial. Maybe the trial was done in Asian population, and you're not Asian. Maybe it's done African American, you're not Asian. Maybe it's done in European countries that very have different gene. Let's say mm -hmm. Switzerland only. So you can't translate a star trial to everyone because we're right. human. Number one. Number two. In the trials, if if A did if if A did worse than B, right, as treatments, let's say I'm treating blood pressure with A and B, B is better, it doesn't mean A did not help anybody. Right. So you can't just say, oh, it's bad. No, it might be better. Look, blood pressure medication, for example, um, calcium channel blocker, right, amlodipine, works better, if I, if I remember correctly, for African-American compared to Caucasian. Other medication, loss of time, less for, why? Because genetic also play an important role. So look, what I'm trying to say is that there is studies are great, but also we need to decipher the the, the genetic component of everybody, right? And and see, you know, where you fit in things. Like for example, endometrial scratch. I do endometrial scratch sometimes for failed implantation. The biggest randomized trial in New England Journal of Medicine showed that there's no difference in outcome. I see it working for a lot of my patients. Again, they might be in the group that did worse, but it helped someone. What I'm trying to say is that trials are great, but at the same time, they change with time. Right. Okay? They do change right. with time. All the trials in the past showed that hormone replacement therapy, the WHI study, which is the biggest study in the world, 15, 20 years ago, showed women who were taking hormone replacement therapy were ha have high risk of breast cancer and blah, blah, blah. This study was published in the best journals, turned out to be one of the worst studies. When they did the KEEP study, which is much better designed from the get-go, they found it lowers heart disease. Baby aspirin. We used to give it for older men to lower heart disease. Now, the recent studies and trials show that actually these men are dying faster, more, because they're having brain hemorrhage and GI bleed. So, we're, so science changes, okay? You can't just change. It's nice to know what's going on to counsel patients, but at the same time, it's important to say what, you know, um, that, that it, can I offer options and try to go back and say, okay, what, do, what has been used in the past and try to kind of target that person to this category. This is how we do it at RFC. Yeah, and I think that's such a smart thing overall is to think critically about statistics, you know, and and not be confined by statistics to decide whether or not you could ever be successful. They're certainly helpful to understand the information, but you have to remember you're still an individual, which is essentially what you're saying is hey, we have no clue until we actually get in there and start looking around and seeing you as an individual and, right. and really trying to understand what's going to work for you. I mean, I think that's such an important message that women need to be listening to as opposed to, hey, if you're 40, it's over, right? I mean, it's like, wait a second, that's, that's not true. No, it's not true. Look, we've helped, we have, 50-year-olds, three of them 
in the last 12 months pregnant with their own eggs. One of them delivered a healthy baby, two are now ongoing pregnancies, thank God. If we haven't tried, this is a baby. I always tell patients, look, even if your chances are 4%, okay, imagine I, I come, nobody is allowing me to try, and I know my chances are 4%. So out of 100 women like me, four will have a baby. I want to do it. If I was one of those four, I have a baby. It's not a car. I changed my whole world. So, and by the way, the ASRM, which is the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, they used to say, if the pregnancy rate is less than X percent, or I can't remember five or one, whatever it is, they said it used to be futile, you shouldn't do it. Now they said, as long as the patient knows, they, 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 they found out that really it's patient's autonomy also plays an important role, but a lot of women are not being allowed to try with their own body, right? So, so we need to kind of understand also there is a lot of, for example, if someone hasn't slept with a man and tried with a man and now she's 44, it doesn't mean she has infertility. Give her a chance. You know what I mean? So I'm just giving you an example. People at 44 get pregnant when they have sex, but this person can't. Same-sex couple, they're not exposed to. Uh, so you, what I'm trying to say is that the diagnosis of infertility, you know, sometimes is vague. And we take everybody just based on their age, you're infertile. No, that's not true. A lot of people don't have infertility. They just were not given the chance to try. Right. I think that's massive because it's, I think, when we get stuck in the idea of it's just age, it's just statistics, we lose the humanity and, and we forget. I mean, it's hard to measure the human will and the human heart. I mean, I had my son at almost 44 naturally after years of being told. God bless that, you. Yeah. I mean, like they told me for years, hey, IVF hasn't worked by now. It's not going to work for you use a donor egg. And even though donor eggs are amazing, they're wonderful, right. a wonderful right. gift. Right. It's right. like, that's not for everybody. And it's that's just, it's, it's so refreshing, Dr. Murphy, to hear a practitioner who is in the trenches, like actually say that, that, you know, give women a chance to try and, and not just treat us like we're numbers. I think that's right. huge. Look, I mean, another, th I agree with you 1 billion percent. And look, a lot of my patients are okay with donor eggs, but yeah. they just want to make sure they exhausted all the resources before they do. You know what I mean? It is okay because look, I want to be given a chance with the, with the most novel technology to try at least. If I have a baby, great. If not, then I'll go to donor egg. So I think the mentality is, is allowing patients to at least because look if i was a patient i don't want to say i wish i wish i tried this right right i just want to try it and say okay i did this multiple times blah 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 and i want to move on to the right so i think that's what bothers a lot of women they're not given the chance to try with their own eggs and they tell them oh your egg quality is bad just by looking at the image i'm like how do you know you can't we can only know the quality of the egg after you do egg retrieval and look under the microscope. There is no test for egg quality. There's reserved for it says that's for egg quantity. It drives me crazy when they tell patients you have bad egg quality just because they have low AMH. So, so you know, it's it's important to kind of, you know, give the chance, give the patient the autonomy to understand that this is what we have. It works. It might or might not work for you, and then let them decide. Right. And that's what, I mean, that's why I focus on the work that I do, because I think that a lot of women have abdicated their power and, and haven't taken a minute to say, wait a second, let me check my thought process on this. Let me see, am I thinking like a woman who succeeds on this journey? Because so many different pieces come together to create that success. And if you're thinking like, okay, I don't have a chance, you're not going to do the things that can help you get there. If you're already telling yourself you're a failure, you're not going to do the ozone. You're not going to go do PRP. You're not going to do all of the things so that you cover your bases. I always tell women, look, 
a donor eggs are an amazing gift, but if it's on your heart to truly check the boxes and make sure you're doing everything to support your success, you can't exclude your mind. You're 1 billion percent right, Rosanne, because first of all, and you, if, if you can ask my patient, when they come like this, I'm like, why are you cranky? Are you coming to have a baby or why? <laughs> Either go somewhere else or you need to smile. And then it's important to one, believe that you can do it. Two, believe that your doctor can do it. Three, believe the clinic can do it. Because look, if those three don't I let, go somewhere else, and I tell my patients, if you don't think I can get you pregnant, go somewhere else. I don't need your yeah. money. Because it's the positivity and working together as, as, as a team with positivity is very important. I was having a consultation with a couple yesterday from Florida. The man was like this. I said, I said hi, how are you? Do you mind smiling a little bit? So he started like loosening up and at the end of the consultation, but it's important. It's important, you know, where people have, have sex in nightclubs, having fun and they get pregnant. We should, have, we should do the same thing. We shouldn't be stressful, even though it's infertility. That's what we do at RFC. We want to make it the journey also smooth, fun. At the same time, we're very serious about our job. You know what I mean? So, so but you're right. The mentality has to change. Yeah, it's and it's so I, I mean, I love your approach and I love that it's holistic. We're we're looking at the whole person, not just a ovaries or sperm or eggs. It's it really is about the whole person. And I think in the end, why your work is so powerful is it is about empowerment. It's about allowing people to try using their own bodies, if additional modalities are needed, that's great. It's it's about bringing it all together. And I think it's really changing the conversation. And I'm just delighted with what you do, Dr. Murray. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> when, when but look, at, but addition, the, the good things about us at RFC in me, I think we listen to our, and we want to learn from our patients. Just yeah. to let you know, I heard about the ozone from one of my patients six years ago. I never knew what ozone free therapy is. Seriously. Well, I heard from my patient openness. first about the PRP. They came to me, I want to do PRP. I'm like, what the hell? It's bullshit. Go to Greece. I didn't believe in it because there was no study. I learned from my patients. And I tell them, always my patients, if there's anything you, you know, they send me studies, I'm happy to try it and incorporate it as long as there is no harm to you and to anybody, and it's been done before on humans, I'm willing to try it because this is how we move science forward is by learning from each other. Well, and I think it's, it, I think it's that openness that when you have a physician that's open and a patient that's open, it's a wonderful team because, you know, and I always, when I'm coaching women, I'm like, look, your physician is not the enemy you know, you, you have to work together. You have to come together as a team because an effective team is fun. And, and you know, you got to remember, you're trying to have a baby. This is not getting a tooth pulled, right? right. You, you got to go into it with an open mind and an open heart. And I just, I love what you're doing, Dr. Murphy. So I'm Thank so you. appreciative <laughs> for all the, all the good work that you're doing. So so what's next for RFC? What are what's exciting and new that you guys are doing? I, I have a suspicion it's in the Caribbean. <laughs> Look, we're always craving new things. Okay, I wake up thinking about new things. Okay, uh, so the next the next thing is is, is the stem cell ovarian rejuvenation. So we're starting in the Bahamas in January of 2023. Fat stem cell ovarian rejuvenation. Fat is also called adipose stem cells. So, if, you know, I have a lot of it. But stem cells is the treatment for everything. It's used now to treat heart disease, type 1 diabetes, uh, nerve injuries, all that stuff. Because the stem cells, they, and we have, we have a lot of it all over our body, believe it or not, the bone marrow and the fat. But those stem cells are neutral, neutral version cells that have no function, never have any job. And then you put them in an ovary and activate them. 
they can become a new egg. They become, they get a job based on whether you put them. So if I take stem cells from my fat and put it in my scalp and activate, it becomes a hair follicle. If I take stem cells from my fat and put it in my liver and activate, it becomes a liver cell. That's the beauty about stem cells. It's not FDA approved. That's why I'm doing it in the Caribbean and the Bahamas. Um, studies have been incredible showing that, you know, even postmenopausal women had new eggs and start to ovulate on their own up to one year. Yep, up to one year. So, so I am super excited. So, this is very exciting to me, right? So, so, so one is, you know, I'm not saying everyone has to jump to the Bahamas and do that. There are a lot of options. Now, a lot of my patients whose PRP didn't work for them, and I always tell patients, this PRP might not work for you 50% of the time. We're moving to, you know, uh, the, the, the adipose or fat stem cell uh, ovarian rejuvenation. It's a simple thing. It's not invasive. It's like PRP, but we do mini liposuction. So you make sure if you're too skinny, please eat. <laughs> <laughs> we need some of your fat. Yeah, yeah. That's then, awesome. I love it. And then, because patients joke with me, it's like, I have no fun. I'm like, you go eat cookies. But, you know, and then, so so that I'm very, very excited about this. Um, I'm going to travel to the Bahamas one, one weekend per month, uh, do procedures and come back. So there is not a lot of spots, unfortunately. And believe it or not, we're almost booked for 2023, the whole year. It, that doesn't because, surprise me at all. I mean, because that does not it just, I wish, me. right. I think I mean, if I have more time there, probably would do more. It's just because, you know, um, I'm just one person. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, but it is so, I mean, Dr. Murray, this is so freaking exciting because it's changing the game. Right. It's really changing the game. And it's such a, I mean, as like a mind body nut, like I am, it's just, it blows me away how we have this innate ability to heal even within ourselves. I mean, it's so exciting uh, to hear that you're doing that work and God bless you. I mean, I, I think it's going to be fantastic and I can't imagine like uh, just, I, I think it's going to be an incredible gift to so many women. So I, love I hope that. so. I really do hope so. I really, really hope so. There's a lot of, you know, great people, great patients who really, I know they will be great mothers. I really do. And I, God knows how much I, I want to help them. We want to help them at RFC. I, I mean, and hopefully we will. We will always do things. We're always new, new things. After this 2024, hope, or by end 2023, we're doing the mitochondrial replacement therapy, hopefully, which is egg rejuvenation and getting mitochondria from donor eggs and keep your own DNA in the egg. So there's a lot of things we're doing, we're working on with the pandemic, with the Caribbeans are a little bit slower, slower pace than Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine and, that, yeah. And, and I am too hyper for people, I think. And, and they're the opposite, which is great. I need someone to slow me down. But that's why it takes a little bit longer in the Bahamas than, than, than here. But also, I, I just wish the FDA take more seriously the, 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 the female reproductive system and women's reproduction, right? I don't feel like it, they take it as a priority. Uh, there's a lot of things we're behind in this country, and it, it, it actually makes me sad. Um, but uh, hopefully things will change soon. Yes, well, very soon. Well, Dr. Murphy, it has been such a pleasure to have you on. I I just fell in love with you the minute we, we talked the uh, first time. And so well, I fell in love with you and you sent me this. Thank you so much. I <laughs> love it. Look at this. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think it's fantastic. I, mean, I think it's beautiful. You did it in your kitchen. It's just amazing. And I have to tell you, I mean, I, I don't want to patient, mention patient's name for HIPAA, even though she, I don't think she cares because she uh, introduced me to you. And I saw you the stuff that, that, that you give, the, corn, the stuff that it's just really you empower women in many, many ways. And I was very, I even tweeted, I, I mean, I'm not tweeted. Um, um, I think it was Instagram. I, I posted, posted, yeah. posted. Yeah, on the Instagram. Uh, every talk, everyone's talking about tweets now. That's why I said tweeted. But that's why I posted on my Instagram things from from you. So, so 
it's just really the words that you put there it really affects the brain it actually gave me goosebumps when i when i saw it from from my patients so keep up the work it's really nice uh, yeah you know, no, and, I, and I, I felt i fell in love with you before i even met you honestly <laughs> i appreciate that we're a good team so well thank you so much dr murhi i think the women listening to My this are going to absolutely love it and i hope they absolutely check out rfc we're going to put all the links to your thank website you, you. and your social in this and and get women out there rejuvenating their ovaries and giving themselves the chance that they deserve so thank you for that i hope so thank you for having me very much Love this episode of the Fearlessly Fertile podcast? Subscribe now and leave an awesome review. Remember, the desire in your heart to be a mom is there because it was meant for you. When it comes to your dreams, keep saying hell yes.